welcome to Swipe from the sunny-ish south of England. Here's a little glimpse at what we'll be bringing you on this week's programme. Alex checks out the tech-saving Tudor treasures. I meet the man behind a jet-powered suit and get a look inside his lab. And we've got the new fighting game from the makers of Mortal Kombat. They say that battle changes you. I don't know what it is about Wiltshire, but this is the second week in a row I've come here to film an episode of Swipe featuring men who can fly. Last week it was all about a wingsuit, this week a jet-powered one. That's coming up a little bit later on because first we're going to check in with Alex who's been getting the most modern of history lessons. He's been to a mansion that regularly hosted Henry VIII and his various wives to see how they're using the latest technology to save the building and its treasures. The Vine, a 16th century Tudor powerhouse nestled in the Hampshire countryside. A treasure of the National Trust, its story is one of challenge, change and survival. So in Tudor England, this walk would have been very different than I'm taking now. This grand mansion behind me would have stretched right the way down to the water and was built by one of the most powerful men that Henry VIII needed to keep on side, his Lord Chamberlain. And Henry himself would have come here, first with Catherine of Aragon, then his ill-fated second wife, Anne Boleyn. But as you can see, over the centuries, the house has been knocked down, rebuilt, adjusted, and at the moment, vital work costing over £5 million. And using the latest tech is taking place up there on the roof in order to save this building for future generations. Centuries of storms have taken their toll, with leaks from the crumbling roof threatening the artefacts inside. And with the tiles stripped off, much of the decay is easily noticeable. But the threat posed by moisture under the surface is effectively invisible. Traditionally, you'd have to have burrowed into the structure to really examine it, but not anymore. So the higher tech things we've got are, for example, this trace it which is an optical profilometer. So what's that? What's, um, that, what's that to someone like me? In simple <laughs> terms, that really gives you a good image of the surface, but it also renders that into 3D. Techniques like this used by heritage scientists allow you to effectively see through the walls without leaving a scratch. We use a number of different microwave techniques to detect moisture at depth within the wall. This is a handheld uh, version of these. And it's very simple, you simply place it against the uh, material, it comes up with a reading, and then you can map moisture distributions across a wall very easily using something like this. So if you like, what we're able to do is not only see inside the wall, but also detect the very first symptoms of deterioration before it becomes a problem. The focus might be repair work, but it's also a unique chance for archaeologists to use the science of dendrochronology, or tree ring dating, to calculate precisely when the house was built. Well, what you do is you, you'll end up with a sort of finger-sized uh, sample. These have to be cleaned under a laboratory, and then uh, they're run through a microscope that records each of these growth rings. And if those are then run through uh, a, a computer program, you can actually relate them to timbers of known date. And when you get a match, you can actually determine uh, when, when the uh, actual felling date is for that ring at the end. We've never been quite sure of the exact date when these um, buildings were constructed, but with these precise dates, I think we've got about three of these timbers that have all dated to 1526. On Henry's many visits, it was likely the affairs of state on his mind and not the state of the roof. But without this vital work today, there was a very real danger that what remains of this house could have been lost. Alex Morgan, Sky News. Stick around for our games review in just a few minutes. We're throwing you into a futuristic space battle. But before that... Now for the reason I'm at a farm in Wiltshire. You could actually call it a testing site for this. This video of British inventor Richard Browning testing his jet-powered suit has been watched more than a million times. The ex-city trader and former Royal Marine Reservist has no formal engineering training, but he does have a huge amount of curiosity, as I discovered when visiting him at home in Wiltshire. Yes, so this is the, uh, the lab. This is where um, I've spent quite a bit of time over the last 18 months uh, developing the, uh, the jet suit. Is this the very suit that you wear? That is, yeah. We, we, we suspend it all in that place just so you can connect it up and test it. Um, but yeah, that is, that is pretty much all the equipment. You, you have a pair of engines on each arm, so that's one arm, there's the other arm, and these ones actually go around my, uh, around my waist at the back. Each engine then is plugged into, uh, into one of these brains. And then we get up here. 
This is a holographic heads-up display helmet from the company called Daiquiri. Um, it's a pretty neat piece of kit. It uh, displays all the uh, engine data and fuel consumption data that uh, gets wirelessly transmitted by the suit. So it's, um, it's a very neat way of being able to monitor the system and uh, monitor our fuel. So it's, it's giving you information on the inside of the visor? Yeah, it's kind of hovering in, in a, like a fighter pilot kind of heads-up display. So if you'd like to have a look and see what I see when I'm flying it. Ooh, this is heavy. How, how much would this cost? Uh, Daiquiri sell these now for about $15,000. Um, this is the only black one in existence. They very kindly built us a, a really quite customised one. Okay, I think, I think maybe it's a bit big for me. The suit cost Richard less than £100,000 to create, but the hundreds and hundreds of man-hours from him and his team, he says, have been the greatest expense. And if you're wondering why he even began the project... Uh, if I'm really honest, it was uh, the starting point was just to have an enormous amount of fun taking on the challenge of human flight, but from a very different perspective. Taking it on from the idea of uh, leveraging the human mind and body and then adding to that rather than putting the human form in a flight vehicle. You know, what would, what would be possible if you really leverage the mind and body capability? So time to find out more about Richard's mind and body capabilities. We're heading to a nearby farm, his testing ground a few minutes away. It's suiting up time, and there's a lot to consider. Oh, I forgot one of those GSU things again. Never mind, it'll all work perfectly. Uh, Deb, can I have your help for a second? Richard's wife seems to be used to this part of the operation, helping him buckle up and get ready. Does this not worry you? Uh, it did initially when he first told me about the project and what he was aiming to do. Um, but since I've been following it for the last few months, um, I understand how it works a bit more. It is not as bad as it looks, and I might even possibly have a little go myself with the arm engines at some point. That's a fireproof suit you're wearing, yeah? Uh, yes, it is. There's a, there's a fireproof base layer underneath all of this. That's just really a precaution. Even though the fuel is um, usually diesel, paraffin or jet fuel, it's really you know, not particularly dangerous. It doesn't turn into a vapour cloud. It doesn't suddenly spontaneously ignite. It's all very much sealed up in the uh, fuel tank system. Warming up the engines takes about 90 seconds and it's noisy. You can smell the fuel and feel the intense heat. Here we go. Richard says the suit could fly thousands of feet high and at speeds of several hundred miles per hour. The only thing stopping him from doing that is the danger risk. He controls the direction of the suit by adjusting where he points the engines. It's a very strange uh, feeling, a bit like riding a bike in three dimensions. You don't really think about what you're doing when you're riding a bike, it just happens. The balance is quite natural. Richard's team is now working on a second, more advanced version of the suit, and even a children's option that apparently won't involve jet engines, but still aims to give wearers a superhero feel. Richard's taking a breather and refueling, but we've got more action for you now because it's video games time. Here's Lucy with her pick of the latest releases. Injustice 2 hits this week, which is a fighting game based in the DC universe. So you'll have probably heard of Mortal Kombat, and this game comes from the creators of Mortal Kombat. And it, basically, it's a fighting game, but with DC characters. So, you know, you've got Superman, Batman, the Joker. Brainiac, Scarecrow, Catwoman, Supergirl. I mean, I could go on. There is a massive roster of fighters that you can play with. It has an awesome story mode. The heroes and villains are kind of fighting and working together, a bit of an uneasy alliance to try and get Earth back on track. Uh, it's an awesome fighting game. It has this really cool mechanic called the gear RPG system, where after you play, you unlock different kind of different items to wear, and they can affect your base stats. You can, of course, take the take the fight online and play against your friends. So if you like fighting games, or even if you just love DC characters, then definitely give Injustice 2 a whirl. The Surge is a Dark Souls-esque uh, third-person game. So when I say Dark Souls-esque, I mean that the game is difficult and requires you to really focus on your enemies. You can't just go in all guns or swords blazing. You have to really study the enemy movements and kind of attack accordingly. So the surge is very similar to that, uh, except instead of being in a high fantasy setting, it's in the future. We have depleted all of Mother Earth's resources and things are getting a little bit hairy. So it's basically you fighting against the industry that has ruined 
the earth and in order to do that you have this kind of exoskeleton suit that you can modify and upgrade and you can put your talent points into the fighting style that you like basically. If you fancy a bit of a challenge then I definitely give the search a go. Farpoint is a PlayStation VR title, so Sony launched their PlayStation VR late last year and it was a big success. And now they are continuing to support it with titles and Farpoint is a VR only title. So you have your headset and you also have this new controller called the AIM controller. And it basically looks like a bent bit of plastic tubing, but it sort of replicates a gun. And it's basically a first person shooter game. Uh, you are on a space station that crash lands and there's loads of bugs everywhere. So it's basically a little bit Starship Troopers-y. So, you know, if you're afraid of bugs, maybe skip this one. But it's kind of nice to be able to see like full games on the PlayStation VR system. A lot of the time previously, we've just had little demos. And now with games like Resident Evil 7 that you can play completely in VR and now Farpoint, Sony are really investing into this technology. So if you fancy giving it a go, then Farpoint is the one for you. You know who I am? It's a mad, mad world we live in. Well, that's it for this week's show from here in Wiltshire. Thank you for joining us once again. And don't forget, you can catch up with any of our Swipe episodes on demand in all the usual places. And why not follow us on Twitter, at Sky News Swipe. Then you can see what we get up to throughout the week. I'll be back again next time. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>